I think I got my first win within about six weeks, six races of my first event. And my first race ever was in 1972. And in 1974, I won my first national championship and had a contract with American Honda. I loved all of it for him. Um, he always loved coming back home. I enjoyed him for what he was and it was just, it was fun. I mean, we went places and he always brought a big smile to my face and nobody else really seemed to matter to me. Marty Smith was absolutely the right guy at the right time, in the right place. He's gorgeous, he can ride, and he's got the red, white, and blue. He completely dominated the, the when the 125 class started as a full national championship in 74, and then 75 he completely dominated. My youth was hot and the golden kid and the L.A. movie star, rock star, little race guy. Being with Honda and uh, he was a good looking kid. Seem to be uh, always some nice girls around and all that. Everything about him, the, the gear, the bike, the style, and he was winning and he was a nice guy. It was like, <laughs> it's everything. This is what we want to be. Here's a guy from San Diego. He's 17 years old. He's riding for factory Honda. He's making $100,000 a year. He drives a turbo Porsche and he's traveling the world still in high school. Every kid coming up, growing up racing motorcycles wanted to be Marty Smith. The only thing I could do is really follow in the in the magazines and, and just kind of be in awe of how cool his style was, how cool his gear was. We used to scour those, you know, looking at every little page and we'd see Marty in there with his bionic arms and all this stuff. My gear was the same, everything was just identical. My Bel Ray patch was on the same side, my Electro patch, everything was like exactly like him, you know, so I was kind of like the mini-me of Marty. I didn't have as nice, nice a hair though, and tan. I still wasn't old enough to be an AMA pro, but I was racing a lot of local CMC stuff. And at local races, it was Tommy and Marty at a completely different level. Marty actually signed with Honda in 11th grade, and I signed with Honda when I was a senior in high school. Prop and Marty were right up here. We were all here, and everybody else was down here, okay? It was just a different level. Tommy Road tended to ride at a little larger 250s and 500s, and Marty was their 125 guy. When he was on that factory Honda and the RC 125, there was nobody going to touch him. I mean, you didn't even think about beating Marty. Tommy might have thought about beating Marty on occasion. A lot of people would say, oh, well, you, you and Marty got first and second at the 500 Nationals, or, you know, you let Marty beat you. And, and, and I said, well, why don't you try to go beat him? It's not that fun to try to beat. He, he rode almost flawlessly on the motorcycle. Could, you know, tell he wanted to win, and, and he, he was ready to, to do battle. You look back on a lot of the starts in 76-77, uh, the whole pack's in the first corner. Well, where's Marty? He's a bike like now front. I think he started real well, and obviously he was in great shape. Super smooth, and he, and he rode up front like Roger, kind of, you know? They always try to be smooth and to make it look nice. Matthew seemed to do that naturally, you know? May, maybe better than me in, in some way. He had his own sort of extra little bit of style and flash that, that some of the Europeans didn't. You know, they were like business, get the job done. And Marty, whether he meant to or not, got the job done, but it looked really, really cool. Good control, he wasn't a dirty rider at all. And he would pass you claim. You know, most of us fell off occasionally, but you never saw Marty on the ground or a picture of him on the ground, which is a good thing for winning races. I like to do it as long as I feel good on the bike. And you know, I, I, if I get too old where I think it's dangerous, I'll quit, you know? Do you ever think it's dangerous? Oh yeah, it's dangerous, but as long as you just take care of yourself out there and oh, use your head, it, you know, it'll be all right. A lot of the news out there 
is about Marty, and it's about how great he was and how good looking he was and what a great writer he was and how he was maybe the first American of significance in our sport. But I have to tell you, Nancy was special. I think he actually met her at a gas station there on Mission Bay, you know, she was pumping gas. Tommy Croft and her went to grade school together. We were flying to a race. Marty tells me he had met this girl that he was madly in love with, but he's told me that all the time, you know. <laughs> I ended up growing up with Nancy and, and lived right across the street from her, and we were in fourth and fifth grade together. She was a, a little bit of a tomboy, but what I always respected about Nancy, she was somebody that you knew where you stood right off the bat. Just full of energy, just completely wide open all the time. There was a lot of women coming around Marty, and Nancy was pretty tough. I mean, I don't know if she physically beat him all over the head with a baseball bat, but that was her demeanor, you know? It was like, leave my guy alone. If you look at the pictures of Marty and Nancy together, you'll always see her touching him or have her arms around him. She's protecting her man. She's letting everybody know that, you know, we're together. This is my guy. The God status of Marty Smith left at Plymouth. Yeah, in the first race. In 1976, I think Honda uh, had convinced him to try to bite off a little more than realistic, you know, to try to win a world championship in Europe on a completely different motorcycle, try to race the AMA championship and also win uh, a racing championship over here. And Yamaha had just introduced a new, all new water cooled bike, and, and Bob Hanna had introduced it, came onto the scene on that bike. And they ran him to death. And they thought Marty Smith was the greatest rider ever, which he was. And they sent him to Europe, and then he'd come back after ride against me. They sent him to Europe the next week, then he'd come back and ride against me. And they were helping me beat him. One, there's, you know, the physical time difference and how tired it makes you in recovery. But Marty, on top of that, he was very much a San Diego guy. Even when we raced nationally, he was you know, sign a few autographs, but he had to get in the rental car and get to the airport. There's great stories about him driving to the airport in his riding gear so he could get home. It was really just too much for Marty to try to tackle, and that, that, that year took a lot out of him physically, just from the pure travel. Without him going to Europe, I would have had a lot bigger time, you know, a worse time. I might not have beat him. I don't think anybody's ever tried it since then. It's only been done one time. He was still successful doing both. He got second to Hannah that year, which is really good. He won some GPs over there. It was just a hard, grueling time for him. I remember all the pictures when he went to Europe, and she was always right there. And it was just like, that's cool. She called Marty Martin. Very rarely did I ever hear her called Marty, Marty, like we all did. Super sweet, always just give you the shirt off her back. She was an angel. She was so sweet to everybody. She never changed her personality from when I met her that day in the, the dittos and the, the flowing blonde hair. And she was 100%, you know, back in Marty. So they were, I believe, a really good team. You know, maybe my second year and I was struggling still a little bit and we were going up to the line and I was a pick ahead of him for the main event and he came over, we were talking and he was telling me what gate I should pick. He was only like a bikeway in length. I remember him going back and Nancy was there and he, she was like, what the heck are you helping him for? You know, he, she always wanted to have, you know, her own identity. You know, she was a postal person for her entire career in life. She did, probably didn't need to work, but she did. And she just wanted to have a little bit of her own life. She was the love of his life and he was the love of hers. Marty was known to be a little frugal. With him taking care of all his grandkids and all his kids and everybody in that compound that was the Smith compound, you know, that kind of wrecks that theory. You know, he took care of everybody. He was a proud pop and a proud grandparent. It was a freak accident, wrong place, wrong time, sun in the eyes, driving north, small Razorback, turn into it, the dirt's right there, and Marty wasn't wearing a seatbelt, and it threw him out. Damn it, Marty, why didn't you have a seatbelt on? But, you know, Nancy had her belt on. I just couldn't believe it was both of them. You know, it was just... Shock. I mean, it was early in the morning, four or something, and um, I didn't know what to say. I couldn't talk. Marty Tripes called me, and it, and he, his voice is cracking up, and I just, and. Oh, 
it was, it was kind of a shocker, you know. It just hurt. It just was, you know, I mean, my wife was there. And it just wasn't good, you know. Last time I saw Marty, we were in Italy having wine and having a great time and fun, and, and I saw him smile more than I ever did, and, you know, it's just like, come on, you know, you're going to lose that smile? That's no good. I haven't even processed it really yet. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to really take it all in. I kind of just, you know, trying to act like it never happened. It's still just surreal, you know, to, to see their pictures and to, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's tough. I'm glad I got to know them. I'm glad I got to see that era and try to be somewhat like them, end up on Honda and, you know, I don't think I came close, but I tried. If he knew what we were thinking, he would say, do not stop living and do not stop having fun because I died doing a fun thing. You need to do more of it because you don't know when your time's coming. It was great then, but you really appreciate it when you're older in life. I'll run into a lot of people, they'll always go, well, I used to be a fan of yours. And I, I was going, well, what, what, what happened? What happened? Why not anymore? You know? <laughs> Of course, in the beginning he was a hero, but then he became really, really good friends. So then I lose your hero, you lose your hero and your friend. And to lose somebody that's been a lifelong friend of yours and a huge influence on your life, and um, and yeah, and I told you I wouldn't tear up. I thought I had it perspective. I think it's important to stick together. Um, and when it gets rough, even more so, and be nice to people. And if you're going to do something, do it well and, and let your personality and how much you love it and how fun it is show. Don't just go through the motions, like put some heart and soul into it so that years later people are crying talking about it. Cut. I feel like I've lived a Cinderella story. Um, my life is absolutely complete with my husband and my children and my grandson now. Um, my husband is a very sentimental man now. And as before, I saw a lot of um, me, myself, and I, and now it's all family first. Would I have liked to have that other championship in 77, that 250? Hell yeah, I would. Would I have liked to have won a Daytona Supercross? Hell yeah, I would. There's a few things that I could say, hell yeah, I wish I had, but, but to wish on it and, and dwell on it, no way. Hell no, I'm super happy with how my career turned out. I'm super happy where I'm at in my life with my wife and my, my, my kids and my grandkids and my dogs and, and, and being retired. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I couldn't be in a better place at this time.